lift up our voices and worship Him. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our worship. He deserves all and glory, all the honor. He's a gracious God. He's kind. He's merciful. He's full of compassion. He's slow to anger. He's a tender-hearted God. Blessed be your name, O oh God. Daddy, we have come again just to learn at your feet. We ask, O oh God, that you unveil your word to us again. Let your presence be mighty in our midst, O oh God. Thank you, our Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Thank you. Please take your seat. We will continue our discussion on grace. Last week, we practically just introduced and tried to define what grace is. Today, we will look at grace in the Old Testament. For a long time, I didn't really look at grace as something that you can find in the Old Testament. My idea of God was that the God of the Old Testament was a different God from the God of the New Testament. But as I went to study, I discovered that God has never changed. He has always been a God full of grace. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 to 9. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 to 9. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And he repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and creeping thing, and the fowl of the air. And it repented me that I had made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. The passage we have read is the very first place that the word grace is mentioned in the Bible. And Bible scholars will always advise us when we are studying any subject, the first place it is mentioned in the Bible, you need to take a critical look at it. In this passage, God had looked at the way mankind was going and he was really sad. The Bible says that God he regretted that he made man. God decided he was going to destroy the earth. But when he looked at one man, that man found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Just one man found grace in the eyes of the Lord. When you look at that Bible passage, it says the man found favor with the eyes of the Lord. When God looked at him, so I can't destroy this one. The rest I can destroy, but this one I can't destroy. Now, when you read the Bible, especially verse 9 of that passage, Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, it said, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. If you read only that verse, it gives us the impression that the whole world was sinful. But Noah was the only one that was not a sinner. Noah was serving God. He was holy. He was a one that was a saint in the midst of the rest. But looking at verse 8, it tells us that that is not the complete story. The real story was that this man, Noah, experienced the grace of God. It is the grace of God that is the, is the reason for the life of Noah. It is the grace of God that is the explanation 
for how one man in the midst of such a perverse generation could be described as just and perfect. He was not just and perfect by his own strength, but by the grace of God. It was because he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And like we tried to introduce last week, when we talk about grace, grace is not just a passive force. Grace is not just God overlooking faults. Grace is an active force that enables a man to be what ordinarily he couldn't be. So we can see that grace here enabled Noah to be able to walk with God walk with God and be described by God himself as a just man and one that was perfect. To the extent that when God was going to destroy the earth, he said, no, 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 I'm going to preserve this Noah and preserve him with his family and start the human race afresh with him. Noah was one person who enjoyed the grace of God. My purpose in today's study is for us to see that when we talk about grace, it's not entirely a New Testament subject. Because some people teach grace and they take it to extremes. So anytime they are teaching grace, they shut out everything in the Old Testament. They shut out everything in the Old Testament and they say, no, the Old Testament was law. We are under grace. That's why they go to extremes where they begin to look at the fact that, oh, once someone is saved, they can never be unsaved. Oh, once someone is, uh, no matter how somebody is committing sin, God will not destroy him, God will not punish him, because we think that grace is just something that started in the New Testament. We can see that grace has always been there. Noah was the first man to be described by the Bible as finding grace in the sight of God. Yes, in John chapter 1 verse 14 to 17, John 1 14 to 17, the Bible tells us that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. But that's just the fullness of it. The fullness of it that's always been there. God himself is a God of grace. God is a gracious God. Exodus 34 verse 6 to 7. Exodus 34 verse 6 to 7. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in loving kindness, I mean, abound, and abundant in goodness and mercy. You see, this was God. You know that that day that God told, I mean, Moses cried to God to show him His glory, and God said, "Okay, I'm going to introduce myself to you." God announced. God declared Himself. It was God Himself that was proclaiming His own name, His own person. He said, I am the Lord, the Lord God. I am merciful. I am gracious. This was what Moses seized upon in his intercession when God was going to destroy the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. Moses said it back to God. You are a gracious God. How can you destroy these people? You are full of grace. And at that point, God had to answer his name because he's the one that announced that I am a gracious God. God is a gracious God. Yes, he punishes iniquity. But if God was going to deal with mankind according to their iniquity, not one man will survive. Not one. God is a gracious God. It's a gracious God. He's full of grace. Second Chronicles chapter 30, verse 9. Verse, Second Chronicles 30, verse 9. For if ye turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land, for the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. This was his place when God had already given the children of Israel up to be carried away to exile in Babylon. But as they were going, the prophet told them, so if you turn again to the Lord, if your brethren and their children, or your children, the day they turn back to God, they will find compassion before the people that are carrying them into captivity. 
That's why when you read the story of the of the children of Israel, even in the land of captivity, people like Daniel became mighty leaders in the land of captivity. People like Esther became queens because God was being compassionate to them, even in their captivity. He said, I think the Lord will bring you back again. He will bring you back to this land because he is gracious and merciful. He will not turn away from you if you return unto him. Even in the Old Testament, I will always look at it. Oh, in the Old Testament, once somebody committed a crime, God will just kill them. It was not, that's a very wrong picture if you look at it very clearly. Yes, God was punishing sin, but he was a gracious God. He was not punishing sin with wickedness. I is the same God. He has not changed. He has not changed in the Old Testament. The same God of the Old Testament, the same God of the New Testament. It's the same grace that manifested in the Old Testament, manifested in the New Testament. Although in a greater measure, we understand it better in fullness because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But God has always been gracious. That will now let us know that grace can punish. Those who think that grace is exemption from punishment, it is not true. The children of Israel were experiencing grace. Some punishment is said is a form of grace. Psalm 86 verse 15. Psalm 86 verse 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that created heaven and earth. This is the God that we walk with, we deal with from time immemorial. He has always been the same, full of compassion and gracious, long suffering, plenteous in mercy and truth. So God is a God of grace. And I'm going to just pick some, 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 some portions of the Old Testament to buttress the fact that grace has always been there. So that it will, when we go into the New Testament and we begin to examine grace in fullness, we will not, it will prevent us from going to extremes when we see grace in the Old Testament. Look at the creation of man. If you look at Adam, we see God's grace in making Adam in his image. God made man in his image. Man didn't apply to be created that way. God just made him like that. It was God that decided to make man to be like him. I mean, like we're studying on Sunday in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 33. God created birds. Sometimes you just look at their life, it looks meaningless. But they are birds. They are praising him. He created fishes, created different, different things. But he made us different, special. We, can, we are the only ones that can really fellowship with him because he made us in his image. That's grace at work. That's because we say grace is favor. Grace is love. Grace is kindness. Grace is goodness. God has been good to man even in, in the way he created man. And when God created man, look at how God made provision. You will notice that man was the last thing God created. I mean, he, he, he did everything. He made everything he knew man was going to need. He did it first before he made man. Man became the crown of his creation. After the man was created, water to drink, fruits to eat, everything. And then God looked again and said, no, no, this man needs a wife. It was not Adam that made the complaint. God on his own. We say grace is what you don't deserve. Undeserved favor. Unmerited mercy and favor. That was God showing grace to Adam. Even after they have committed sin. These Bible passages are there for you to read. You know, the, to read the entire Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. We we'll see there. In, in Genesis chapter 3, even after Adam had sinned, it was God that came to the garden. It was not Adam that went looking for God. God was the one who came looking for them after he knew that they had committed sin. He could have just destroyed them from where he was. I mean, he has not even gone far. Just, just two of them. Just destroy them. Create another man and another woman. And start afresh. He could have just done it. <laughs> no, but grace made him to come. To seek these people. To give them an opportunity to repent. And to defend themselves. 
And then God went ahead to make clothes for them. After they had covered themselves with leaves. And God knew the leaves to just fade away a few, after a few days. That's love. That's grace. And then even God made a promise. That look, I am going to send a redeemer to you. To come and redeem you. In Genesis chapter 3, 21 to 24, you will see there how God made clothes for them. But towards the end, verse 24, I just want to read that one. Genesis 3, 24. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. You know, anytime as a young boy I read this Bible passage, what used to come to my mind is God chasing them away and putting a sword out of anger. It was an angry God. That's a picture I used to have in my mind. Until I realized later when I was doing this study that the reason for them not being allowed to eat that tree of life was that if they ate that tree of life, they will live forever. And they will live forever in their fallen state. At this point, the tree of life was no longer useful to them. It will create more problems to them. You can imagine if man was going to live forever in this mortal body, who remain sinners. So God placing the was so that they would block them from coming back to eat the tree of life. So even their dying was a, a form of mercy. They will die, he will give them new bodies. And they will, they will be in heaven with him forever. Do you know that Adam and Eve are in heaven? Because they repented of their sin. They were punished here on earth, but they repented of their sins. They are in heaven. We are going to meet them there. But if they are eating the tree of life, then they will remain immortal in their fallen state, in their sinful state. So that was an act of love. It was an act of grace. God is merciful. Even in his punishment, he is merciful. Even his chastisement is merciful, he's gracious. We have already talked about Noah, so I don't need to I, need, I don't need to go back to that again. But you can see how Noah experienced the grace of God. It was by grace that he was described as a just and perfect man. It was by grace that he was able to follow through every instruction that God gave him. Abraham Abraham's life is just a demonstration of grace first of all how did God choose him it's a picture of a man saved by grace chosen by grace Genesis 12 verse 1 to 3 is that the Lord has said to Abraham to Abraham what was his background what made him different what made him special of all the men that were on earth, why did God just go to Abraham and say, this is the one I want to use to start a new thing? Just grace. He could have chosen anybody. Anybody at all. That was grace. Then in Genesis 15 verse 6, Genesis 15 verse 6, the Bible says, and he believed in the Lord and he counted to him for righteousness. When you go back to the writings of Paul, Paul is always referring to Abraham as a father of faith. I know faith is associated with grace. What God gives to us is given to us by grace. We receive it by faith. So whenever someone is being described as a man who has faith, it just says that he is experiencing grace. Everything that made Adam, I mean Abraham to be called righteous was because he had faith in God. It was not so much of maybe his intrinsic purity. It was not to say that Adam was so pure, Abraham was so pure. That's why the Bible called him righteous. You know, his righteousness was by faith. And that is the description of what grace is. Giving us righteousness that we don't deserve, that we don't work for. All that Abraham did was God spoke to him, he believed. That's the manifestation of grace. We too, that's the way we enjoy grace. God gives a word and you believe it. 
I want to hasten to say that everything that we experience from God, we experience it by grace. Salvation is by grace. Healing is by grace. Everything is by grace. We don't work for it. Look at Joseph. Genesis 39, verse 1 to 4. Genesis 39, verse 1 to 4. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian. An Egyptian bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had, he put into his hand. Genesis 29 verse 20, 39 verse 21, the same chapter, look at verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Joseph was a man operating under grace. You see, we say grace is favor. When you are operating under grace, you find favor not just with God, but with men. When you see a man constantly enjoying the favor of men, is a sign that he has the favor of God. That was the situation of Joseph. Even in his father's house, out of 12 children, the father just made him a, cloth, a, a coat of many colors. Not even Benjamin, that was the last born. He was second to the last. But he carried, he, and he was enjoying the grace of God. That special favor was upon him in his house. When he got to the house of Potiphar as a slave, he enjoyed that same grace. The Bible says he found grace in the eyes of this man. Yes, you can say that Joseph was living a decent life. He was, he was pure. He was, yeah, but what made him to be like that was grace of God. It was the grace of God. That he stayed in that house, was tempted and he refused to commit sin, was the grace of God. When he went to the, to, to the prison, grace of God. The day he stood before Pharaoh, grace of God. Pharaoh could have listened to him interpret the dream. And then he would have turned to his assistant and said, if you can free this guy. I think uh, at least give him some money. Release him from prison. Find a good job for him. Let's look for somebody who can do this thing he just suggested to us now. But this one is a slave. How can we make a slave to become a prime minister? That's grace. Favor upon his life. I'm hoping that at the end of this study, we will be stirred up. Because, you see, each of us has grace upon us. There's grace upon us already. As children of God, there's grace upon us already. But we need to be conscious that we have grace upon our lives. And we need to use the grace that God has already placed upon us. Moses was another person who enjoyed the grace of God. I remarked there, Moses was the one who gave the law. Moses was the one who instituted all the sacrifices. Do you know, I didn't find one place in the Bible where Moses himself practiced all those things he was giving this people to do. Oh, if you want to come to the temple, you must bring this uh, sacrifice. You must. Moses, no. Moses wants to talk to God. Every other Israelite who wants to talk to God will come with animal sacrifice. Moses wants to talk to God. He stands, lifts his eyes, and begins to talk to his God. He was operating another level together. So, why was the rest of them operating under the law? Because the Bible said the law was a taskmaster. To bring them. Remember when God brought them out of Egypt. He brought them to Mount Sinai. He didn't institute. He didn't start with law. God spoke to them. After God spoke to them. They gathered themselves. They told Moses. Moses. We don't want to hear that God again. Please. That his voice is too, is too, is too fearful. You go and be listening to him. When he tells you anything, come back and tell us, we'll do it. That was the greatest mistake of the Israelites. 
they would have been operating under grace like Moses. They wouldn't have needed the law. The law was there to help them to obey God, to do the right thing. They didn't need it in itself. If they could have understood God and learned to know God, learned to serve Him freely. So when you read through the Bible, God was speaking to Moses face to face. That's why he could, Moses could boldly tell God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. Genesis, Exodus 33, 11 to 23. Exodus 33, 11 to 23. You know, the Bible talks about how God used to speak to Moses as a man talks to his friend. Then he mentioned another person there, Joshua, the son of Nun, that he never departed from out of the tabernacle. That tabernacle that the other people told, don't come near. Joshua was living inside. That's grace. So you now see why he was able to take over from Joshua from, from Moses. They understood grace. David. David came much, 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 much later. When you study the life of David, you will be amazed. The king before David saw had to wait for Samuel to come and offer sacrifice. And because Samuel delayed and he proceeded to offer that sacrifice, that was the beginning of his downfall as a king. But when you come to David, David in 1 Samuel 21, verse 3 to 6, 1 Samuel 21, 3 to 6, got to the temple, to the, 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 the tabernacle. He was hungry. He said, do you have any food? They said, ah, the only food we have is the food for, free, for, for, for priests. He said, give me. Give me the food. He ate it. Nothing happened to him. Jesus referred to it again in Matthew 12, verse 3 to 4. Matthew 12, 3 to 4. That. Didn't you see how David, when he was hungry, ate food in the house of God that he was not supposed to touch? According to the law, it was forbidden. But he ate it. He was operating at a different frequency. The frequency of grace. The frequency of grace. This is what the New Testament is trying to introduce. When it says we are not under the law, but we are under grace. It's not to mean that we can live a sinful life. Under the law and not under grace. Not that, oh, you can live anyhow you want. No, no, grace will come. You. No, no, no. It's that you are living at a higher frequency. You don't need those laws. You operate in a, in a frequency of the Spirit of God. You know God personally. You can relate with Him personally. Those laws were there to prevent people from misbehaving. People say everybody should eat that bread now. They will come and be looking for bread every, every day. Come and be disturbing the priest. They will not have respect for it. Even when David committed adultery, as terrible as that was, kill the husband of this woman, lied. All that it took for God to forgive David was for him to repent and ask for forgiveness. You will say, what else is he supposed to do? Go and read the Old Testament. Any other Israelite that did that kind of thing, the day he was discovered, he was to be stoned to death. That is his punishment. Yes, you, after you confess your sin, they will now stone you to death. If you must be set free, you will offer sacrifice upon sacrifice upon sacrifice. But once in Psalm 51, verse 1 to 17, Psalm 51, verse 1 to 17, you read the confession of, Psalm, of, of, of David. In 2 Samuel 12, verse 13 and 14, 2 Samuel 13 and 14, Immediately David said to the priest that I have sinned. God told him, tell him, I have forgiven his sin. Nathan said unto them, the Lord also has put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. They gave him proper punishment to But the real punishment was death. It was waived. I talked about the issue of David con contrasting with Saul, offering sacrifice. When David was to offer sacrifice. 
He didn't need to call a priest to come and offer sacrifice. He would just do an altar and offer sacrifice to God. And God accepted it. The same way men like Abraham could offer sacrifice and God would accept. The sacrifice was David was accepted. He could just operate with God. To the extent that David is the only king that operated both as a king, as a priest, and as a prophet. It is Jesus. He became like a type of Jesus Christ. A type of a New Testament believer. Because we believers now, we are called kings, we are called prophets, we are called priests. If we read 1 Chronicles 28, verse 11 to 19. 1 Chronicles 28, 11 to 19. David matured to a point where the entire design of the temple that Solomon built, God gave most David that design. He said God gave him the design. The drawing of the temple the bill of quantities all these things that we look for architects to do he got it in the spirit bill of quantities that you get a quantity so there david wrote everything down he said the hand of god was upon me he wrote everything down moses only no solomon his son only came to execute what god had designed and handed over to to to, to david that is a man that was operating under grace even in the old testament David prophesied about Jesus Christ accurately. Accurately. At this, at this point, it will help you to cast your mind back to many other Bible characters. And you can see that even in the Old Testament, men who understood God actually operated under grace. Just like I mentioned here, the entire Israelites, they wouldn't have reached Canaan if not for grace. God would have, they would have finished, they would have been finished on, uh, in the wilderness. It was grace. It was the grace of God that led them into that place. Just like we are going to get to heaven by grace, they also got to their Canaan by grace. Look at someone like Samuel. We don't have the time to look at him in details. How did Samuel begin to operate as a priest in the tabernacle. He was not of the tribe of Levi. That is grace. In conclusion, everyone who became mighty for God, even in the Old Testament, it was grace at work. As children of God, there is grace available for us. Grace is available for us to become anything and everything God wants us to be. We need to recognize that it's not by our might, it's not by our power, it's by the grace of God. And that grace is available. That grace is available. We need to lean on that grace more. We need to cast ourselves more on that grace. Come before God. That's why the Bible even calls the throne, the throne of God, the throne of grace. It's a throne of grace. It's a place to find grace. When you go to God, you cry for grace. You ask for grace. And in your daily work, when you look at a task that you think is too difficult for you to do, cast yourself upon grace. If there's anything you want to receive from God and you feel you are not qualified, cast upon the grace of God. That grace will qualify you. There's a song here. I heard Clint Brown sing it. I don't know that he's the one that wrote it. Where would I be? You only know. I'm glad you see through eyes of love. A hopeless case, an empty place. If not for grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I once was lost, but now I'm found. A hopeless case, an empty place, if not 